Psalm 33, 12 tells us, Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people he has chosen as his own inheritance. In Judges chapter 2, verses 1 through 13, we read the following, and it's a sad reminder of what happens if you and I do not pass on to the generation coming up behind us the knowledge of God, what God has done in making this nation what it is. And when you do a study of American history, and I know it's not being taught in school the way I was taught it when I was in school, but you have to remember, I lived back in the days of the dinosaurs. They were still roaming upon the earth. But it's a sad, sad situation in which we live where American history is being twisted and is not being taught accurately. But if you were to do a study of American history, you would find out that there was divine intervention on more than one occasion during the Revolutionary War where God divinely intervened on behalf of establishment of this nation that we know as United States of America. But notice here in Judges chapter 2, beginning to read with verse 1 down through verse 13, and I'm reading from the New English Translation. The Lord's angelic messenger went up from Gilgal to Bochum. He said, I brought you up from Egypt and led you into the land I had solemnly promised to give to your ancestors. I said, I would never break my agreement with you, but you must not make an agreement with the people who live in this land. You should tear down the altars where they worship, but you have disobeyed me. Why would you do such a thing? At that time, I also warned you, if you disobey, I will not drive out the Canaanites before you. They will ensnare you, and their gods will lure you away. When the Lord's messenger finished speaking to those, these words to all the Israelites, the people wept loudly. They named that place Bochum, which literally means weeping, and offered sacrifices to the Lord there. When Joshua dismissed the people, the Israelites went to their allotted portions of territory, intending to take possession of the land. The people worshiped the Lord throughout Joshua's lifetime, and as long as the elderly men who outlived him remained alive. These men had witnessed all the great things the Lord had done for Israel. Joshua, son of Nun, the Lord's servant, died at the age of 110. The people buried him in allotted land in Timnath, Heres, in the hill country of Ephraim, north of Mount Geish. The entire generation passed away. A new generation grew up that had not personally experienced the Lord's presence or seen what he had done for Israel. And what a sad commentary. Verse 10 is, I'm going to read it again. The entire generation passed away. A new generation grew up that had not personally experienced the Lord's presence or seen what he had done for Israel. The Israelites did evil before the Lord by worshiping the Baals. They abandoned the Lord God of their ancestors who brought them out of the land of Egypt. They followed other gods, the gods of the nations who lived around them. They worshiped them and made the Lord angry. They abandoned the Lord and worshiped Baal and the Ashtoreths. Lord, today as we read this passage of Scripture, it serves to us as a grim reminder of what happens when a nation turns their back on you. And God, there are many, many things that are trying to destroy America that have come against us, Lord, as a result of many who have turned their back upon you. But God, I'm thankful that there's a remnant, and I'm thankful that, Lord, there is indeed a light that is burning, that although Satan has tried to diminish it, Lord, the truth of the gospel is still going forth. And I am believing and trusting in the mighty name of Jesus Christ for one more outpouring of your spirit in this great land of America, and many hearts will be turned back to you as my prayer. But we understand, Lord, that we're living in the last days. Time is growing short. And Lord, it's up to us. We can sit around and wring our hands and we can complain about this and we can say, do you believe what's happening or whatever? But God, we can make a difference. And time after time, we read in the word of God throughout the course of history, Lord, not only in, in the Bible days, but even in present time, when men and women would take a stand for truth, for what is right, 
The Lord based their principles upon the word of God. It's amazing, God, how you honored that. And you transformed hearts and lives and nations as a result of it. So one more time, I would pray, Father God, that your Holy Spirit would walk with me into this pulpit. I pray for a fresh anointing upon my mind, upon my mouth. I pray that the word that comes forth today will be anointed of you. And might you receive all glory, thanks, and praise giving. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. I'm glad to tell you today that I grew up in a time when patriotism was a given. Everyone seemed to know the songs, the words rather, the patriotic songs. And pride in our country was a remnant of the World War II sacrifices that had touched every America. Such songs as, my country tis of thee, this land is your land, this land is my land, and so on and so forth. And the idea that our military exists to make and keep us free has been ingrained in me since childhood, and it is the backbone of my patriotism. I also have lived through the decades that have exposed the darker side of the American experience. Yet even with its imperfections, I enjoy being a part of the American family as we strive toward the ideals of democracy. How many of you would join with me in saying today, I am proud to be an American? Amen? Patriotism is basic to the future of democracy, my friend. There have been many crises since we declared ourselves to be independent 243 years ago. Yet you and I, as a nation, have remained free. And the most cherished of these freedoms is the freedom to worship as we please. But the as we please provision can become one of the quickest routes to degradation. What pleases us may not be pleasing to God. The nation of Israel stands as a grim reminder of what can happen when people begin taking shortcuts and use substitutes in their worship of God. At one point, they were undecided as to who or what or the how to worship. How many would you say, agree with me rather, that indecision leads to non-commitment? It does. Indecision leads to non-commitment. Non-committed people are weak and ultimately will be defeated. However, I'm glad I can stand before you today and boldly proclaim that God has made provisions for every Christian to live a victorious life. America can enjoy the freedom of spirit that God's grace provides for us through the person of the Holy Spirit. I love the song, The Battle Hymn of the Republic. And in that song, there is a stanza that should become all of our mottos as a Christian and as a citizen of this great country. It states there in one of the verses, as he died to make men holy, let us live to make men free. May that be my motto. May that be your motto. As he died to make men holy, let us live to make men free. I want us to consider the following traits that you and I can pass along to the next generation as we pray that God will indeed restore his spirit and that God's spirit will indeed become the spirit of America once again. First of all, I would submit to you that one of the things that you and I can do as a follower of Jesus Christ is to commit ourselves to a spirit of total commitment. The Bible tells us in Psalm 33:12, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. When you and I were to call the role of world empires as they are shared in Daniel chapter 2, the kingdom of Babylon, the kingdom of Medo-Persia, the kingdom of Greece, the kingdom of Rome. These nations fell from prestigious heights when they refused to honor the Lord. Israel also enjoyed her greatest hours when spiritual leaders called her to God. And as we read down through the list of the kings, both good and bad, there is one name that, that jumps out at us, and that is a king by the name of Josiah. He was such a man. One of the first statements made concerning this king of Judah is this, is found in 2 Chronicles chapter 34, verse 2. And it says, and he did that which was right in the eyes of the Lord. Oh, that it might be said of our political leaders today, and he did that which was right in the eyes of the Lord. It might be said of our church leaders as well today, and he did that which was right in the eyes of the Lord. Now, I'm sure there were times when it would have been easier to do what was expedient. 
But Josiah was a leader and not a follower. And friend, I'm here to tell you today, we need leaders that are committed to the cause of Jesus Christ. Josiah was a leader of righteousness who demonstrated that God's word is true when it says in Proverbs 14, 34, righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. I'm a firm believer that one of the reasons that our nation is struggling the way that it is is because too many individuals have turned their back on God and have sought secular answers to godly situations. The greatest problem that we have today, my friend, is not something that's the social problem. The greatest problem we have today is a religious problem, and that is that we as a nation need to turn our heart back to God. As America prepares to celebrate her birthday once again, it's good to look back and remind ourselves of some of the principles that have made this country the great nation that it is. One of the strengths of our country is featured on a statue that overlooks the bay where the Mayflower first cast anchor. On the four corners of the huge pedestal were placed figurines representing morality, law, freedom, and education. And at the top of the granite pillar is the fi figure of faith. And in one hand, she holds an open Bible. This emphasis on righteousness by our founding fathers is one factor in America's greatness. Friend, I tell you today, America will continue to be a beacon light of freedom as long as morality is prominent. The whole world will be better when leaders are more concerned with doing what is right than doing what is expedient. Putting the virtues, putting the welfare of individuals ahead of their own selfish interest. Not only do we need the spirit of total commitment, but my friend, I would submit to you that we also need the spirit of togetherness. We read, we the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and posterity, to ordain and establish this Constitution of the United States of America. We know this as the preamble of the Constitution of the United States. And friend, I want you to know today that it took unity, it took togetherness for this nation to come into existence with the blessing of God. Fifty-six men signed it, knowing that when they did so, they were placing their lives as well as the lives of their families in jeopardy. Yet they believed in the cause. They believed in their pursuit of freedom enough to unite and take a stand at peril to themselves. And many of them, again, if you read American history, ended up bankrupt as a result of spending all that they had, even mortgaging their farms and, and their properties and whatever, ended up bankrupt at the end of the Revolutionary War. But they believed in a cause that was greater than themselves. This past Memorial Day, I watched several movies that, that, that were made replicating the, the, the wonderful things that our brave men and women did world, during World War II, and, and, and in particularly uh, The Longest Day, which is about D-Day, where you know American troops and British troops and Allies troops stormed the beaches of Normandy at great cost. And, and then I watched a documentary on that, modern day Army Rangers, and as they went in there, they were explaining the difficulty of scaling those cliffs. They said, and we didn't even have uh, German soldiers firing down at us. It was hard enough climbing up there, let alone trying to you know, protect your life and preserve life against the fire of the enemy that was there. Friends, freedom cost. Freedom cost a tremendous sacrifice. And thank God for men and women such as we uh, have here in our congregation today. Thank God for men and women who see a cause that is greater to themselves and are willing to step up and protect the freedoms that you and I enjoy. The word freedom is crucial. Freedom, my friend, does not exist simply because our Constitution says that it should. During our country's history, people have constantly labored and paid dearly to preserve it. In the past 78 years alone, this nation has suffered nearly 2 million combat casualties while attempting to keep freedom's flame burning brightly throughout our world. But the debts of freedom are never really fully paid, are they? Because the freedoms have never been etched in stone. 
They've been written on the sands of over two centuries, and we have to constantly retrace them to keep them from being blown away by the winds of tyranny and injustice. America was born to freedom and has always believed in this sacred element. Men and women have willingly fought to maintain it. And I tell you today, our military personnel would rather die standing than to see American citizens live kneeling. Freedom and patriotism are not the prizes that can be locked away as perpetual treasures, my friend. They must be constantly nurtured by the toil and the sacrifices of dedicated Americans. They will continue to bless us with their presence only as long as they are vigorously cherished and zealously guarded. So it is with our salvation and religious freedoms. In Hebrews chapter 10, verses 23 through 25, the writer of Hebrews, who I personally believe was Paul, but regardless of who it was, whoever he was, he said good stuff. But notice what it says here, beginning in verse 23. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider on another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Friend, you don't have to be a Bible scholar to recognize that we're living in the days that are drawing to an end before Jesus Christ is going to have his father turn to him and say, son, go get your bride, bring him home. We're living in the last days. I know you might be sitting there saying, well, pastor, you've been saying that for the past 31 years. And I heard it before that and whatever. Friend, may I remind you, we're only 31 years closer to the coming to the Lord than we were 31 years ago. It doesn't mean that he's not coming. And it doesn't mean that Jesus couldn't come right now. The day is approaching. What day? The day of Jesus Christ appearing in the clouds and calling the dead in Christ and those of us who are alive and serving the Lord to meet him in the air and go to the marriage supper of the Lamb. God, help us if you're left behind. You think it's hard to serve the Lord now? Friend, you have no idea. You have no idea. And I'm not trying to scare you into heaven. I'm simply stating a fact. Where are you with the Lord right now? Do you know him as your Savior and Lord? Have you called out upon his name in repentance and said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner? It's not a time, it's not a day to play games. Now is the day of salvation. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. We need the encouragement and fellowship of one another in these perilous times in which we live. Don't take church attendance haphazardly. Don't look at it as something that's an option. Don't look at it as something that, well, if I feel like if I don't have anything better to do, I'll go to church. When the church doors are open, cast your vote with your feet and be there and be in prayer for those who are still out here who are lost, that God will equip the church, that God will equip you because you're the church, I'm the church, that we will go forth with a renewed purpose, with a renewed mission, with a renewed, if you will, attitude toward the loss, that we will care that there are individuals slipping into eternity without Jesus Christ. That's why we exist as a church. It's my job, it's your job, not just because I'm the pastor here, but as a child of God, it's our job to reach the lost with the gospel message. Friend, I'll speak solely for myself. We need the encouragement and the fellowship of one another in these perilous times in which we live. There is no substitute for a godly and healthy church family. I'm gonna say that again. There is no substitute for a godly and healthy church family. Where we come together, we encourage one another. We don't tear each other apart. We don't voice disgruntlement when we're not happy with the decision that is made, but rather we look at what's in the best interest of everybody and not just a, a select few. What indeed is going to help our church to impact the community or whatever and working together in a spirit of unity. Doesn't mean you have to agree with every decision that is made, but when the decision is made, you get behind it and you give it your best effort. There also needs to be a spirit of submission to the word of God. Jesus tells us in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Friend, there is no safer anchor for our soul than God's word. 
Boy, that's a good time to say amen. Come on. There is no safer anchor for our soul than God's word. We must not neglect it, but neither should we go beyond it. And that's a problem today. We have a lot of people who are trying to add their opinion as though it were scripture. We have a lot of people today that are taking scripture out of context and making it meet what they want it to mean when in reality, when you do a study of it, you'll find out that it doesn't mean what a lot of people are promoting from behind pulpits. What heights America would reach if God's word were faithfully proclaimed from every pulpit, not added to, not subtracted from, but boldly proclaiming the truth of God and letting the chips fall where they may. I've said this many times, and I'll say it again. One of the biggest fears that I have, and I, and I mean a holy fear when I say this, is knowing that one day I'm going to have to stand before the Lord and not only give an account of my own life, but give an account of my ministry as well. And I pray to God that there will never be an individual who will stand there and point a finger at me and say, Pastor Jeff, as a result of you not preaching the truth, as a result of you being afraid that you were going to hurt my feelings, as a result that you were afraid I would get mad and leave the church, you didn't preach the truth. And now because you didn't preach the truth, I was deceived into thinking that I was good enough, into thinking that I was living a life that would get me into heaven. And now I'm sentenced to an eternity separated from God's presence. Friends, I get chills even standing here saying that. I pray to God that I'll have enough sense to get out of ministry before I ever compromise the word of God. Let the word of God be true, and may we always boldly proclaim it. What heights America would reach if God's word were faithfully proclaimed from every pulpit? What a difference it would make if it was prominent in every government office, honored in every classroom, adhered to by labor and management. Why do I say this? Because my friend, the word of God has a prominent factor in molding American history. Former President Calvin Coolidge stated that America was born in the revival of religion. He was referring to the preaching of such individuals as John Wesley and George Whitefield. Benjamin Franklin, who was a great admirer of George Whitefield, said this, It was wonderful to see the change soon made in the manner of our inhabitants. From being thoughtless or indifferent to religion, it seemed as if all the world were going religious, so that no one could walk through the town in the evening without hearing psalms sung in different families of every street. Oh, that that would be the case today. I hear a lot of things when I'm walking down the streets, especially in the summertime with the windows open, but unfortunately it's not hymns of church praising God. The Bible, the Bible has always been an integral part of great spiritual awakenings. And it will be a part of every great revival in the future, my friend. You and I do not need to take a defensive position when it comes to the word of God, whether we need to be on the offense and we need to boldly proclaim it. When people begin to read and honor and live according to Scripture, we will see the power of God manifested as never before. And my prayer is, oh God, let it begin here at HFA. My prayer is that every time we gather together, whether it be for Sunday school, whether it be for morning worship, whether it be for the Sunday evening service, whether it be for the Wednesday morning Bible study, whether it be for the Wednesday evening Bible classes or whatever, oh God, may there be a manifestation of your power and of your glory, that souls are saved, that people are baptized in the Holy Spirit, that there are healings, that there are miracles, that there are marriages that are restored, that as people are driving by for unknown reason, they're going to feel compelled to come in, and God, they're going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, and God be merciful to me, a sinner. Let it be, Lord Jesus. May that be our prayer as individuals, as a church. And friend, let me encourage you, if you've got unsaved loved ones, continue to pray. Do not let go. Have the tenacity of a bulldog and say, I will not give up until my son, my daughter, my husband, my wife, this person, that person, whatever, this friend, this neighbor comes to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Because God, I know what you did for me. And God, you love them just as much as you love me. And I will not allow myself to surrender to the fact that they're unreachable. Because God is not willing that any should perish, but all should come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And friend, aren't you glad that he is? 
I humbly submit to you today that time is of the essence. And today is our time. Whether we like it or not, you and I are responsible for this generation. And the way that we live our lives, not just giving lip service, not just when I'm around other Christians, but the way that I live my life on a daily basis is going to have an impact on the generation following behind me. If I don't teach them about God, who will? We can point fingers and say, oh, it's a shame that back in the 60s they took Bible reading and prayer out of the school. But friend, I've said it before and I'll say it again. When did they take it out of the home? When did they take it out of the home? Are you praying in front of your kids, mom and dad? Do they see you reading your Bible? Are you doing devotions with them? Are you teaching them about the Lord Jesus Christ so that they know not only what they believe, but why they believe it and why it's the case that it is? Are you making sure that they have a godly, firm foundation so that when you send them off to these classrooms and their heads are filled with a bunch of nonsense or whatever and nothing against school teachers, please, that's not what I'm trying to say. But what I'm saying is there is a secular motive out there that is trying to discredit, discredit the mercies of God and the goodness of God in our society today. And what I'm saying to you is this, if we don't teach it in home, friends, they're not gonna receive it by osmosis somewhere else. We're responsible for this generation. How do I know this? Because verse 10 of our text stands as a stark reminder of what will happen if we do not pass on godly morality and Christian virtues to our children by the life that we lead. Notice it says there that Joshua passed away at the age of 110. The men of his generation passed away, and there arose a new generation that had not personally experienced the miracles of God. May that not be our case. May it never be said that our children did not personally experience the saving grace of Jesus Christ. May it never be said that our children did not experience the baptism in the Holy Spirit. May it never be said that when there was a crisis, when there was a situation, that the first thing we did as a family was turn to God in prayer and pray together as a family rather than as a last resort. May it never be said that when there was a need, whether it was financial, whether it was physical, whether it was a relationship or whatever, that the first thing that we did was turn it over to the Lord and continue to pray until we saw the faithfulness of God unfold in our lives. We are responsible for this generation. I believe by God's grace, we can be the instruments that God will use to influence the course of America. Because individual efforts, my friend, bring surprising results. Individuals have been inspiring tremendous exploits all throughout history. In sports, one person often leads a team to victory. In politics, one person can sway a Senate. In battle, one soldier can rout a foe. One person with the courage of his convictions has no limitations. The inscription on the bust of General George Patton at West Point reads this, it never hurt this country to have a soldier so brave he was dangerous. I love that. It never hurt this country to have a soldier so brave. He was dangerous. The disciples, after seeing Jesus cleanse the temple with a whip, remembered that it was written of him that he was consumed with zeal for the house of God there in John 2, 17. And would it not be great if it could be said of some of us that are here today that it never hurt the kingdom of God to have disciples so zealous for the Lord? In Acts chapter 17, verse 6, we read where Paul and Silas were accused by the Jewish leaders at Thessalonica of turning the world upside down with the gospel message. Oh, I would love to have it said of HFA by the city council of Harrisonburg, Virginia, by the board of supervisors of Rockingham County. Those people at HFA, those are they who have turned the world upside down for the cause of Jesus Christ. We can do it. I don't know if heaven has a hall of fame for outstanding Christians. But my closing prayer today is simply this. May we live each day 
endeavoring to enter heaven's hall of fame as if there were one. It may be said of us, it never hurt the kingdom of God to have a soldier so brave for the cause of Christ. He, she, was dangerous. Lord, we thank you for this country. We thank you for the wonderful gift of eternal life. We thank you, God, that you use ordinary individuals to accomplish the great. Lord, it's not dependent upon us, but rather it's simply a matter of us yielding our life over to you in complete surrender and allowing you to be Lord of all. Because with your anointing, there is nothing that is impossible for you to do. My prayer today would be, Lord, in the privacy of this moment, if there is someone here who does not know you as their personal Savior and Lord, Father God, they would take this opportunity now to call out upon the name of Jesus. I pray that they would understand, God, that they can't save themselves. And Lord, out of all the decisions in life that they'll make, the most important one is where they're going to spend an eternity. Father, may we not put it off. May we not indeed look at it as something that we can play around with, because now, today, is the day of salvation. With heads bowed and eyes closed in the closing moments, if you're here this morning, my friend, and I'm going to make it real simple, if you don't know for sure that heaven is your eternal home, but you would like to, simply raise your hand right where you are. We might pray together with you right now. You need Jesus. The Holy Spirit is speaking to you. You know your heart is not right with God. You don't know for certain that heaven would be your eternal home, but you want to. If that's you today, simply raise your hand that we might pray together with you. Anyone? Lord, I thank you today from all indications that everybody here is your child. And I would pray if that's not the case, that right now your Holy Spirit would begin to speak. Lord, I pray that in the privacy of this moment, they would call out upon the name of the Lord and invite you into their heart. Would you just pray with me the following prayer? Dear Jesus, I ask today for forgiveness of my sins. Come into my life. Be my Lord. Be my Savior. I confess that you are the only begotten Son of God who takes away the sins of the world. Write my name in the Lamb's Book of Life that I may have the assurance of knowing that I am your child and you are my God. Thank you for hearing my prayer and saving my soul. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.